Well, good morning and welcome once again to the Grace Community Church virtual service. We're so glad that you've tuned in to watch us this morning. And, you know, it would be great if you would raise your voices and sing it out and let all your neighbors hear that you're praising God. So thank you again and praise God. Heavenly Father, the only way for your voice to be louder than everything else around us, I think, Father, we have to get small and quiet. I think that's why in the Bible so many times it says to go to your secret place. I think that's why so many times Jesus went out beyond the city limits by himself to talk to you. Father, even in, in my own head personally, it's so loud and busy. Father, your voice is all that matters. It's the thing that gives us inspiration to write songs. It's the thing that gives us motivation to wake up in the morning. It's the thing that gives us safety to know that we can sleep at night, that you've got everything under control. Thank you, Father, for everything that you do, all that you do that we're not even aware of to make this path for us, to make a way. We praise you with all that we are. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Waiting here for you 
Let's pray for the offering at this time, shall we? Dear Lord, we thank you for the tremendous teachings in the scriptures which tell us that to support you and the work of your spirit on earth through the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ whom you sent to us requires faith. It requires a belief that you will reward us and that you will give back to us so much more than we can give to you. Thank you for the generosity of people who support the ministry of Grace Church. Thank you for their understanding of the tremendous challenge that it is, that it does require faith. It requires looking beyond just the temporal apparent success or no, not success, because we're looking to eternity. We believe that presenting the word of God powerfully, articulately, is the mission of the church. And that's why we support this church. Bless the giver and bless those who give and bless the gift itself and multiply it to the need that is your actions and your program on earth to save the souls of men and women and children. Amen. morning let's come back to our study in the epistle of James where we pick up on his next teaching about the action of faith let's pray Lord once again we ask that your Holy Spirit might help us to be open and receptive to your teachings in the epistle of James about our faith and what our faith is supposed to be Help us, Lord, to hear with hearing ears and to be willing to apply with willing hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. So James is going to talk about faith in this part of his epistle. And I included a verse out of Hebrews about faith. Indeed, we're going to look at a lot about what the Bible says about faith in this sermon. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it, the elders obtained a good testimony. So let's see what this teaching is all about in James. To claim faith, there has to be evidence in action. 
The claim to faith must be evident in the action of faith. It is not enough to say, I believe. It is not enough to claim to be a follower of God. It must be evident in what's happening in your life. James says in chapter 2, verse 14, What good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such a faith save him? So to claim to have faith and to not have the actions that should be evident from that faith or evidence for that faith, then it's possible that there's a disconnect going in here. And I think James, at the behest of the Holy Spirit, is teaching this because so many of the people of the early church and even of all human history um, had this issue of being a claimant of adherence to God and, and to Abraham and to Moses. Jesus acknowledged to some of the Jewish people in his day, I know you are descendants of Abraham. They were claiming this. We are children of Abraham. We believe in Moses. And Jesus said, I know you are, but you're not following what they themselves modeled. So let's look as we go on in. In Hebrews 11, 1 through 4, we're going to read the whole chapter here about faith because I think it comes to bear on this teaching. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a bit good report. Through faith, we, we Christians, understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. By the way, that is the issue about whether you believe in creationism or not. If you don't believe in creationism from the perspective of Genesis, then you don't have the faith. Because if you think that God used billions of years of evolution to accomplish what he did in six days, then you don't know the Bible and you don't know the God of the Bible. So that the things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead still speaks. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony, that he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Faith. Dead faith is blind. And what it is blind to is everything. It cannot even see the obvious need in front of it. The need for salvation, the need for conversion, the need for repentance, the need of a fellow sinner in need, the, the need of a brother in need. Again, James, chapter 2, 15. Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to him, go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. So dead faith is blind. And what it is blind to is the needs of the people around you. Blind to its own need. Blind to the need for salvation, the need for God in their life. And James is using the example of a person who is destitute and a person who says to that destitute person, I wish you well, I hope everything's going to go all right with you, but you do nothing to help alleviate the need, then it is metaphorical in his opinion here, in his teaching concerning faith and no action. Because he says at the end here, in the same way, in what same way? The same way as the person who sees a destitute individual and wishes them well, but does nothing. In that same way, it's like saying, I have faith, but does nothing, then their, their faith is dead. So, just to support this even further, I want to turn to the book of Luke, chapter 10, verse 29. When Jesus was asked about who is his neighbor, who is it that he should be concerned about? Who is my neighbor? Jesus was asked. Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell amongst thieves. 
which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. By chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked at him and passed on to the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring oil and wine in them, and set on him, set him on his own beast, and brought him to an inn, and took care of him. On the morrow, when he departed, he took out two pence and gave it to the host, and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Which now of these three, thinkest thou, was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? And he said, the man that asked the question, he that showed mercy on him. And Jesus said unto him, go and do thou likewise. Now this story that Jesus gives is to show us that if you don't have concern for a fellow human being, and in that case, we saw religious individuals who were actually in the Jewish culture, real religious officials, a priest and a Levite. And yet, they did nothing concerning the man who was in need. Because the Mosaic law actually prohibited them from, in their mind, in the literal interpretation of the law, it says, when you see a dead man, don't go and touch him because it'll make you unclean and you won't be able to function in your capacity as a priest. They didn't say that they shouldn't go and touch the dead man and that they shouldn't um, try to help somebody in need. It said that if they did, they would be unclean. So it would inconvenience them. It would cause them to have to separate themselves, offer a sacrifice, look for cleansing, and then be returned to their duties. But because they probably assumed that the man was dead, they did nothing. So I bring that up simply to help support what we just read, that when you see somebody in need and you say you have faith and you do nothing about it, then where is that faith? Dead faith actually trusts in its own construct. I've noticed this about human religions in general. Through human history, we have this propensity to to trust in what we think we believe, or what our culture was, or what our religion that we were born in was or is. And we tend to trust in its own construct instead of trusting in the one who's behind true faith. Someone might say, continuing in James, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without doing anything and I will show you my faith by what I do. You believe there is one God, good, but the demons believe that. They, they also believe in one God and they tremble with fear. So what's James saying here? He's answering a question that might arise or a challenge that they have faith, like Jesus was told by many of the Jewish religious individuals of his day. We are descendants of Abraham. We do uh, go to the temple. We do tithe. We do pray. And Jesus told them, you're far from God. God told the Jewish people that many times in their history. It's at the heart that he looks. He looks inside of us. So when we say we have faith, And somebody says, I have deeds. I have a religious construct that I believe in. I do these religious things. I trust in them. And James says, I'll show you my faith by what I do. My faith, my faith that I say I have is evidence by the way I live. You, however, trust in your deeds. And that goes against what the whole New Testament teaches. We're not saved by works, but by faith. Our faith produces works, but it is not that which saves us. It is not our religious construct. In true biblical faith, you don't believe in a religion. You believe in a relationship with God. And with that relationship, certain things come forth like compassion, mercy, forgiveness, kindness. So don't trust in your own construct and you might have even constructed something in your own head 
about what you think is right and wrong. And if you trust in that, you're going to be so sorely disappointed because you must trust in a person, and that person is God. You must have total fealty and loyalty to him and him alone, not, not in some kind of a religious construct or theology or, or church or some kind of a, a belief system. If you do that, you will be disappointed because true faith believes in something much deeper. Look what it says here in John, Jesus speaking again to religious people of his own day, religious people who were related, related physically. They had done the, the uh, Ancestry.com thing and found out that they were descendants of Abraham. You search the scriptures, he tells them. You spend a lot of time reading scriptures, writing scriptures. They didn't have copy, copy machines in those days. They had to copy them by hand. There was a whole group of people called scribes, and that was their whole profession. They had to copy scriptures. You search the scriptures, and in doing that, I'm going to introduce some of my, uh, if you will, in between the lines. In doing that, you think that you have eternal life. In what? In searching the scriptures and studying the scriptures and reading the scriptures in a rote religious way. And these are they, these meaning the scriptures, they speak of me. They talk about me. They point to a person. But you are not willing to come to me that you may have life. What were they trusting in? They were trusting in their religious observances. They were trusting in the holy book, but not in the person of who is the author of the holy book. You see the problem here? If you trust in a construct only, if you trust in a religious rote activity, then you're in trouble. You're in trouble because it's very indicative of you not having true faith. Because action arising from faith proves faith. Jesus said it this way, by their fruit shall you know them. James here again, you foolish person, must you be shown that faith does nothing, that faith that does nothing is worth nothing. Faith that does nothing is worth nothing. If it's just intellectual, if it's just academic, it's just in your head, then it is worthless. Abraham, our ancestor, was made right with God by what he did. And when he offered his son Isaac on the altar. So you see that Abraham's faith and the things that he did worked together. They were hand in glove. It wasn't separated. His faith was made perfect by what he did. In other words, his faith was proven. His actions, the actions that arose from his faith with God, his relationship with God, proved what he was and what he claimed. And that's all James is teaching. Now, true faith is accepted by God. And it's the only thing that's accepted by God. It has to be real, it has to be true faith. And there's only one true faith. And that relationship is between him and you. And he knows it and you know it. Do you have a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ or do you not? If you have a relationship that is only religious, that is cultural or social, it was the religion you were born in, or your mom and dad, or your grandparents, and you trust in that. I believe in God. Yeah, I believe in the God of my fathers, of my forefathers. Or I believe in my religion, or I believe in my church. Then you are in error, because true faith is the only faith that is accepted by God. James 2, 23. This shows the full meaning of the scripture that says Abraham believed God, and God accepted Abraham's faith. What was it that God accepted? He accepted Abraham's faith because it was proven by his actions. The faith that made him right with God. God accepted Abraham's faith and the faith that made him right with God. And Abraham was called God's friend. So you now see, says James, that people are made right with God by what they do, not by only what they say not by claiming faith, not by faith only, not by saying, I believe. They must also have evidence. There must be something that shows that they have what they say they believe. Dead faith has no life. In Spanish, we have a word called anima. And in English, the word animation is used to, to talk about the whole uh, industry of making cartoons appear to have life and movement animation. Anima in Spanish means to be, to be given life, 
to have life force. So dead faith has no anima, has no life in it. It's just dead. It's just intellectual. It's just academic. Another example is Rahab, a prostitute, says James, who was made right with God by what? By what she said? No, by what she did. She welcomed the spies into her home. You'd have to read the, the book of Joshua to see this story. She welcomed the Jewish spies into her home in Jericho and helped them escape by a different road. Just as a person's body that does not have a spirit is dead, so faith that does nothing is dead. So faith, the claim to faith, must be accompanied by action. To say you believe in God, to say you believe in Christ even, to say you believe in Christianity is not enough. There must be evidence to prove it. Something has to be there. There needs to be action coupled with the claim or else it's just dead faith. And only you know it. And by the way, God knows it. Many people that appear to be religious outwardly are probably not born again. When Jesus saw this with Nicodemus, he told him he was a religious leader. He was a teacher in Israel's, in Jerusalem proper. He was on the Sanhedrin and he told them, you have to be born again. You need to have a, an experience with God. You need to convert your heart over to the Lord. It's not about just the religious stuff you do. Returning to Hebrews and picking up on the great hall of faith chapter, chapter 11. By faith Noah, being warned of God, of things not yet seen, i.e. rain, floods, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his family, by which he condemned the world that was then and became heir of, uh, heir of the righteousness by faith. By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he would afterwards receive as an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out not knowing where to. By faith he journeyed in the land of promise, he was promised by God to have this certain area. He journeyed there in this land, Palestine, but he journeyed there like if he was a foreigner. Even though it was promised to him by God, the owner of all things, he was treated and lived in the land of promise as a foreigner. Dwelling in tabernacles at his tents, he lived in tents, with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs are with him of the same promise. For he, Abraham, looked for a city which had sure foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Abraham lived in faith. He understood the promises of God, but also understood that even though he was promised temporal land here on earth, that the real home is with God in heaven. Through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age, because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore, sprang out from one man who was as good as dead, Abraham, as many descendants as the stars of the sky and the sand of the seashore in multitude. That promise made in Genesis to Abraham was made in such a way and accomplished in such a way that all credit could only go to God. Some of you listening who have Jewish ancestry, the Jewish people themselves, you would not exist were it not for the tremendous miracle work that happened with Abraham and Sarah through God. You wouldn't even exist if it wasn't for him. And it was because he had faith in an invisible God. It was because he and Sarah both believed in a God that you could not see with physical eyes, but they believed what he said. Now, when you read the story, you see all of the human interaction and turmoil between Abraham and Sarah, and even Abraham and Sarah's thoughts in relationship to God. But in the end result, their belief in God and God's promises was absolute. All of these people died in faith, having not received the promises, but saw them from far away. They were persuaded by these promises and believed them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they are seeking an eternal home. Truly, if they had been mindful of the home when they came, where they came from, they could have returned. But they desired a better home, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. 
By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. He that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac thy seed shall be called. He believed that God was able to raise him up from the dead, from whence he did receive him back figuratively. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau, concerning things to come. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed both the sons of Joseph and worshiped, leaning upon the top of his staff. By faith, Joseph, when he died, made mention of departing Egypt and the children of Israel from slavery and gave command, commandment concerning his bones. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw he was a proper child and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. By faith, Moses, when he came to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the slaves, the people of God in Israel, than to enjoy pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. By faith, he, Moses, forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible, that's the burning bush. Through faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. By faith they passed through the Red Sea, as by dry land, which the Egyptians, a saying to do, were drowned. By faith the walls of Jericho fell after they were encompassed about for seven days. By faith the harlot Rahab perished, not with them that believed not in Jericho, when she had received the spies with peace. And what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, of Barak, of Samson, of Jephthah, of David, and also of Samuel and of the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises and stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword. Out of weakness they were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead back to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain better resurrection. Others endured cruel mocking and scourging, yes, even bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, they were tempted, they were slain with a sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, and tormented. Of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. These all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. God, having provided something better for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. So why did I shift over here to Hebrews? Because I wanted to show you something. The great hall of faith proves that faith is about action. Faith is about living your life of claiming to believe and follow God in a way that shows it. And at the end of the chapter, we find something amazing here. The statement that God provides something better for us, that without us, we, the products of all of these people since Genesis, since Adam and Eve, all of those people who lived in faith towards God, with us, the products of their faith and their suffering, all of us will be made complete, perfect together. Our coming to the true faith finalizes the faith of our forefathers, our spiritual forefathers. It's an amazing thing to understand this. Now, that is to say, if you have this faith, if you are true in the faith that James is presenting. Let us pray. Lord, I do not know how any of the messages that I preach come across to your people. I just know that your word is beyond human authorship. It is beyond human interpretation. I pray that we who have listened to part of your word here, would be convicted in our spirits and in our hearts that our faith must be true. Our faith must be coupled with action. Our action must be something that proceeds from the faith that we claim we have. That our lives should show that we believe in our God.
Our behaviors, our attitudes, our actions should prove that our faith in God is absolute. It is beyond human comprehension. It is not of this world. It is from you. You are the one who grants faith. You are the one who opens our minds and our hearts to have it in our midst. Help us, Lord, because we live in a time where faith is challenged, where belief is challenged. Just as you said when you were here on earth, you said, as in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. And what were the days of Noah? A whole world had turned their back upon belief in you to the point where there was only one family left on earth who still believed in you. Help us, Lord, to hold to you, though we see people all around us, including friends and family members, and yea, even spouses, perhaps, turn their hearts away from you. Help us to hold to you and you alone, for that is the only true faith that saves our soul. Amen. Once again, thanks for being with us today and watching. We love making these videos for you. We really hope that it touched you today. And to those who have contributed to the funds of the church in order to produce these, we really appreciate it. Thank you very much. And if you like what you're hearing and you like this channel, you can like it on Facebook and you can subscribe to it on YouTube. Have a great blessed day and God bless.